Hello, everyone. Welcome to Business School 101. We live in an increasingly interconnected and interdependent world. Globalization touches every part of our lives, from the products we buy, to the food we eat, to the ways we communicate with one another. Globalization is also tied to some of the other biggest issues we face in the modern era, including climate change, trade, terrorism, and the spread of deadly diseases. Being intertwined with countries and markets all over the world has both benefits and downsides, so globalization has both proponents and detractors. No matter which side you're on, globalization is simply a reality of modern life. Therefore, it's critical to understand what exactly globalization is, how it changes the business world, and what factors drive those changes. In this video, I hope to answer those questions. According to the definition from the World Health Organization, Globalization refers to the increased interconnectedness and interdependence of peoples and countries. It can also be understood from two interrelated perspectives, the opening of international borders to increase fast flows of goods, services, finance, people, and ideas, and the changes in institutions and policies at national and international levels that facilitate or promote such flows. Since ancient times, humans have sought distant places to settle, produce, and exchange goods enabled by improvements in technology and transportation, but it wasn't until the 19th century that global integration took off. Following centuries of European colonization and trade activity, the first wave of globalization was propelled by steamships, railroads, the telegraph, and other breakthroughs, and by increasing economic cooperation among countries. The globalization trend eventually waned and crashed in the catastrophe of World War I followed by post-war protectionism, the Great Depression, and World War II. After World War II in the mid-1940s, the United States led efforts to revive international trade and investment under negotiated ground rules, starting a second wave of globalization, which remains ongoing, though buffeted by periodic downturns and mounting political scrutiny. There are two major facets of globalization. First, the globalization of markets. The globalization of markets refers to the merging of historically distinct and separate national markets into one huge global marketplace. Falling barriers to cross-border trade have made it easier to sell internationally. It has been argued for some time that the tastes and preferences of consumers in different nations are beginning to converge on some global norm, thereby helping to create a global market. Consumer products such as Apple's iPhone, Coca-Cola soft drinks, Sony's PlayStation, McDonald's hamburgers, Starbucks coffee, and IKEA's furniture are frequently held up as prototypical examples of this trend. Firms such as those just cited are more than just benefactors of this trend, they are also facilitators of it. By offering the same basic product worldwide, they hope to create a global market. However, significant differences still exist among national markets along many relevant dimensions, including consumer tastes and preferences, distribution channels, culturally embedded value systems, business systems, and legal regulations. These differences frequently require companies to customize marketing strategies, product features, and operating practices to best match conditions in a particular country. If you visit the World of Coca-Cola, a museum located in Atlanta, Georgia, you will find that it not only showcases the history of the Coca-Cola company, but it also exhibits more than 50 different flavors of Coca-Cola which have been made to meet consumers' various tastes in different countries. Therefore, the most global markets currently are not markets for consumer products, but markets for industrial goods and materials that serve a universal need the world over. These include the markets for commodities, such as aluminum, oil, and wheat, for industrial products such as microprocessors, computer memory chips, and commercial jet aircraft. The second facet of globalization is the globalization of production. Globalization of production refers to the sourcing of goods and services from locations around the globe to take advantage of national differences in the cost and quality of factors of production, such as labor, energy, land, and capital. By doing this, companies hope to lower their overall cost structure or improve the quality or functionality of their product offering, thereby allowing them to compete more effectively. Let's use the iPhone as an example. Anyone who has bought an iPhone has likely seen the note on the company's packaging that its products are designed in California, but that doesn't mean they're manufactured there. Manufacturing is a process of making the components that go into the iPhone. While Apple designs and sells the iPhone, it doesn't manufacture its components. Instead, Apple uses manufacturers around the world to deliver individual parts. 
Because there are hundreds of individual components in every iPhone, it is impossible to list every manufacturer whose products are found on the phone. Here are some of the suppliers of key parts of the iPhone. Chips from Qualcomm, based in the US with locations in Australia, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and more than a dozen locations throughout Europe and Latin America. The battery from Samsung, based in South Korea with locations in 80 countries. The camera from Sony, based in Japan with manufacturing facilities and support centers all over the world. The accelerometer from Bosch Sensor Technology, based in Germany with locations in the US, China, South Korea, and Japan. As a consequence of this trend, exemplified by companies such as Apple, Samsung, Sony, and Bosch, in many cases it is becoming irrelevant to talk about American products, Japanese products, German products, or Korean products. The outsourcing of productive activities to different suppliers results in the creation of products that are global in nature. That is global products. Beside manufacturing activities, companies are taking advantage of modern communications technologies to outsource service activities to other nations as well. For example, the internet has allowed some hospitals to outsource radiology work to India, where images from MRI scans and the like are read at night while American physicians sleep and the results are ready for them in the morning. Many software companies, including IBM and Microsoft, now use Indian engineers to perform test functions on software design in the United States. Other companies from travel agents to banks are outsourcing customer service functions such as customer call centers to developing nations where labor is cheaper. If you call the service center of Bank of America or Expedia in the evening and hear a strange accent, don't be surprised. Most likely the other side is sitting somewhere in the Philippines. However, companies must be careful not to push the globalization of production too far. As we have seen during the U.S.-China trade war and the COVID-19 pandemic, Substantial impediments still make it difficult for firms to achieve the optimal dispersion of their productive activities to locations around the world. These impediments include formal and informal barriers to trade between countries, barriers to foreign direct investment, transportation costs, and issues associated with economic and political risk. That is why after the pandemic, many countries are considering moving some essential industries, such as healthcare products or semiconductor industries, back to their homelands for the national security concern. There are four major factors driving the move toward greater globalization. First, technological drivers. Technology shaped and set the foundation for modern globalization. The developments in the transportation and communication technologies have accelerated the pace of globalization over the past 40 years. The internet has enabled fast 24-7 global communication and the use of containerization has enabled vast quantities of goods and commodities to be shipped across the world at extremely low cost. More recently, the rise of social media means that national boundaries have become irrelevant as producers use new forms of communication and marketing to target international consumers. The widespread use of smartphones has also enabled global shoppers to have easy access to virtual global markets. Similarly, the rise of new electronic payment systems, including e-invoices and mobile pay apps, also facilitate increased global trade. Second, market drivers. As many domestic markets become more and more saturated, the opportunities for growth are limited and global expansion is a way most companies choose to overcome the situation. Common customer needs are also incentives for firms to choose internationalization. Many Fortune 500 companies, such as Apple, Samsung, Toyota, Microsoft, Pfizer, and General Electric, generate more revenue from foreign markets than their domestic market. Besides companies, many countries also depend more on the international market than their domestic markets. For example, according to a recent report from the World Bank, France, Great Britain, and Germany all derive more than 55% of their gross domestic product from world trade. Third. Cost drivers. Sourcing efficiency and costs vary from country to country, and firms can take advantage of this fact. Labor costs are the greatest source of potential savings, accounting for approximately 60% of the total cost advantage. A factory worker in the United States or Europe typically costs between $15 to $30 per hour. In contrast, for the same type of job, a Thailand factory worker earns less than $5 per hour giving Thailand a three to six-fold advantage. 
The cost advantages are similarly impressive in the service industries. For example, an English-speaking Indian employee typically costs 50 to 60% less than his or her U.S. or Western European counterpart. An accounting employee might cost a business $26 to $30 per hour in the United States, while a similarly qualified worker would cost just $10 to $12 per hour in India and $15 to $18 per hour in Eastern Europe. Lastly, political drivers. Economic processes are not operating in a political or institutional vacuum. Reducing or even eliminating barriers to trade in goods, services, labor, and capital are political decisions. At the end of the day, whether economically motivated cross-border activities do actually take place or not depends on the policy frameworks in place. Therefore, whether cross-border activities are facilitated, made more difficult, or even completely forbidden are heavily impacted by the global and local political environment. For example, the decision of a country to reduce import tariffs is essential for the size and structure of international trade in goods and services. Lower barriers in trade increase the incentive to trade with other countries. This decision is in the hand of the national government or parliament. The same applies to the decision to reduce capital controls which are used by national governments in order to regulate the inflow and outflow of capital. Finally, immigration regulations of individual countries are an important limitation of international migration flows. The removal of these restrictions within the fundamental freedoms of the European internal market is supposed to increase cross-border migration between European Union countries. Okay, let's do a quick summary of today's topic. After centuries of technological progress and advances in international cooperation, the world is more connected than ever. Globalization not only helps companies to explore new opportunities and expand their business overseas, but also helps firms to sourcing goods and services from locations around the globe to take advantage of national differences in the cost and quality of factors of production. There are four major factors driving the move toward greater globalization, which are technological drivers, market drivers, cost drivers, and political drivers. Because globalization is such a critical topic and influences almost every single aspect of our daily lives, I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of globalization to the U.S. economy in another video. So, do you have any questions about the impact of globalization? Please share your thoughts below. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.